Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. Happy Fertility Goddess Austera Day! What? What? No? What is the weather she's saying? I don't know. It's August. <laughs> it's, it is August, but we're talking sort of about Easter today, which some people will not celebrate because it is obviously from the pagan ritual of celebrating the goddess Ishtar, the goddess of fertility. Obviously. Obviously. Fun oh, facts. yeah, that's right. I, I forgot about that. You know, and that obviously means we can't use the word or, I don't know, even celebrating it is suspicious because Bi- the Bible never tells us to celebrate it. So, you know. <laughs> well, I, I, why I, would God want us to be, you know, happy and have special days? Yeah. Well, I've always found it interesting, too, where it's like, Oh, if you if you do this thing, you know, it started out as this pagan ritual. It's like, well, you know, here's the thing uh, said in my best monk impersonation voice. Um, <laughs> you have to actually be aware that you're worshipping a false deity to be guilty of worshipping a false deity. <laughs> <laughs> Which is another reason I don't think the hyper dispensational what is the you know what is the mark of the beast going to be people don't understand as well is that you have to be aware you're taking on the mark of the beast for it to mean anything <laughs> you mean if they you, slip it into my social security number my bank account that that i'm okay you? <laughs> you know. well that's obviously the exception no, no of course it's ridiculous it's patently ridiculous <laughs> well so here's the thing though even if you don't recognize that the god you're worshiping is false, if it's a false god, I mean, like you wouldn't worship it if you thought it was false, right? Yeah. You still have to be aware that you are worshiping it, <laughs> and act, you have to be purposefully doing so. Oh, yeah. oh, so your the emphasis is on the worship here. Yeah. That the worship yeah, is a it, knowing uh, thing. The emphasis okay. is upon the act of the will. In- gotcha being part of it. You can't worship. accidentally worship Aoster. <laughs> right. Right. I mm-hmm. I can like stretch and do stretches and not accidentally do the Eastern yoga. Yes, right. precisely. Yeah. We're going to get angry emails about that alone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely from both sides. <laughs> yeah. All right. So why are we talking about this? Well, we're we're making our way through the book of Judges. And early on, we are told that uh, about every generation or every other generation, God's people, having been delivered in the past and having endured God's blessings for a generation, apostatized. And in their apostasy, they would go after the local fertility gods, Baal and Ashtaroth. Let me read from uh, Judges chapter 2. This is kind of a summary. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baalim. It's a plural of Baal. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he delivered them to the hands of spoilers and spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Uh, and so this, this is a pattern that uh, Israel keeps going through. And the gods whose names come up most often, sometimes it's just generic, the gods of the countries round about or the gods of the Philistines and the Syrians and so on. But when there any names are involved, the most common, not the only ones, are Baal and Ashtaroth. Or Baal and Asherah. Asherah in the uh, King James is, is usually rendered um, grove because mm. she was represented by a pole or a tree or something that we still don't know a whole lot about. But the, the Hebrew word is Asherah and it seems to be either, well, in some sense, a representation of, of, of a goddess who may or may not have been the consort of Baal or of El or of some other Canaanite deity. Anyway, we can file enough. that under things that we can be glad we don't know more about. Yeah, that. we really don't need to know a whole lot about um, about Canaanite religion. Back in the 30s and 40s and maybe 50s, when Bible scholars or archaeologists addressed Baal worship, 
and Ashroth worship at all. They would generally go so far and then say, and, and the rest is not fit for publication or not fit for polite speech. You're not fit to talk about in, in, in public and just drop it. I'm sure that left a lot of people puzzled and wondering what, what was so evil. You can't even talk about it. Okay. The point is you don't need to know. <laughs> um, today, it, it, the stuff that they did is, is like stuff that characters do in primetime TV. So it's a little different. So if we wanted to, could we go back to the sources that those authors in the 30s and 40s were using? It's like, what was it that they knew? How did they know it? <laughs> and like, just because they didn't tell us doesn't mean that we can't find out, right? Well, one assumes, but um, you, not all Bible commentators, for instance, footnote their work very well. Mm, um, especially and, in the early 20th century. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know. I assume that that would be possible. But I'm since reminded I re of a footnote that says, um, this was once revealed to me in a dream. <laughs> <laughs> Is that one of Anne Fadiman's? I think I recognize I'm, it. I'm actually not certain. I just, it, it, it's always, wherever I've seen it, it's always been by itself without like any <laughs> reference to what book it's in. Oh, but it is always, it, oh, isn't that where she's teaching, the chapter where she's teaching you how to do footnotes and referencing, showing you how to reference everything? Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun or something like that. Amazing. Yeah, well, what is the name of that book? Um, Ex Libris is the right, title Libris. of the collection. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, now and, I learned something new. <laughs> but she's she's not only insisting that good writers uh, footnote everything; she's making fun of how overboard you can go with this, and that may be where that shows up. Anyway, so throw that on our list of books referred to for the episode. <laughs> Uh, what we have, some some things about Baal worship it, it's it is so vague and the Bible deliberately does not give us a lot of information. Well, one, the Israelites didn't need it; they already had way too much information. That was kind mm -hmm. of the problem, or yeah. at least part of it. And what the Canaanites did was not significantly different from what other pagan nations did. So the the gist of it, the, the main ideas are not hard to find. We have a male side of the deity; we have a female side. They're supposed to get together and be fertile, and their divine fertility is supposed to overflow into ours with fertility of uh, human bodies, of lands and the crops, of the cattle and flocks and all that. And so when the land is not producing or women are not having children or something like this, it becomes incumbent upon one the individual worshiper or the king as the leader of his people, to try to get the gods to get on with it, to present to the gods such an offering as will shake them up out of their cage and, 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 and get them going so that nature, as we experience it, will be fruitful again. So they're nature deities, a, female, a male and female side. Male is the sunshine, the lightning, the thunder, all that is big and loud and violet, because obviously that's male. And <laughs> the female is the receptive, quiet, peaceful side, um, the fertility of Mother Earth, of the, the womb and of the flocks and all of that. And as we as we read through scripture, we do get a few cues here and there. For, first things first, though, Baal's a title. It means Lord. Mm -hmm. It's like saying, we have a God. Yes. <laughs> so everybody. Yeah. Do you believe in God? <laughs> yes. So would, Most people do. Which, 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 so. so the question, which, which bale is relevant because every city had its own bale. That is its Lord of whatever. And its own Ashtaroth, its own Ashtaroth. What, they, they had multitudes of God, but they were all more or less sorted out to a male and female, female, female groups, usually with some lead. And so the title, Baal and Ashra. Having said that, though, male and female, Lord. Uh, and um, star, I think, is what uh, um, Ashtaroth means, to uh, similar to Astarte, the Phoenician name for the female goddess. Having said this, originally, they weren't gods like we think of. They weren't like, you know, Loki is played by Tom Hiddleston. They weren't charming, <laughs> interesting individuals whose pictures you could draw and who to whom you could send fan mail. These things were the forces of nature. The, mm. 
Baal was the sunshine, was the rain, was the thunder. Uh, Ashtaroth was the fertility of man and beast and, and, and all of that. That these things became personified is not surprising. It's hard to get excited about, let's go out and worship gravity. You, you just, it lacks something somehow. Have you ever talked to a physicist before? Well, there, <laughs> there is that. You know, let's worship the Big Bang today. Um, yeah. So, but in time, mythologies grew up around them. Not nearly as interesting as the Greek myths, let alone the, the Norse myths, which are much more fascinating. But what what the Canaanites were doing, in effect, was manipulating nature. They they weren't particularly creating relationships. You need to have a relationship with Baal. Have you had a personal relationship with Sarte today? It wasn't that. It wasn't that they loved these beings or they loved these forces and in that sense worshipped them. The worship was the bribing, the begging, the threatening, the can't we get something out of you if we do the right thing. One of the prized things that you in theory could do to get these forces' attention was to yield up your firstborn child, that's your firstborn son. Because anybody who would give up his firstborn son really means business. Huh. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so child sacrifice was uh, one of the more disgusting uh, and horrific aspects of Baal worship. And particularly when Baal is, operates under the name Moloch, we see a good deal of it. Modern archaeologists are, are, are trying to backpedal on this and say, Oh, no, 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 that never really happened. Well, maybe now and then in rare cases in extreme measures. But I mean, who would really sacrifice their children? It's not, nobody was that bad. Um, G.K. <laughs> Chester. Yeah, G.K. Chester. that. <laughs> G.K. Chester, on the other hand, has a, a chapter or two in um, The Everlasting Man where he contrasts Carthage and Rome. Now, mm-hmm. being a good Roman Catholic, he wants to kind of give some kudos to the Roman Empire that preceded the Roman papacy. He knows that Rome was bad and pagan and all that, but it wasn't that bad. And so he has this whole chapter saying, yes, well, the Romans worship gods, but they were respectable gods. They were <laughs> nice gods. I mean, they were false gods, but still, they didn't actually demand anything too terrible. And at the end of the day, uh, a man could go home to his farm and his gods. And we understand that and sympathize. Across the sea, however, was Carthage. These were Phoenicians. These were Canaanites. They sacrificed their children to Moloch. And isn't it a wonderful thing that Rome finally destroyed Carthage in a series of three wars, the Punic Wars, and and, and removed this, this, this plague from the face of the planet so we, we can give thanks to Rome that its false gods got rid of the really demonic gods. Um, Gilbert, I think your your perspective here is a little bit warped. Uh, it's one thing to, to recognize, yes, indeed, there are degrees of evil. Some demons are worse than others. Jesus said so. You know, the demon who gets kicked out and then eventually returns and finds his house swept and garnished and goes out and gets seven devils more evil than himself okay so there are there are bad there are evil demons and there are yet more evil demons yet don't want they're they're demons you don't need any of these things around (laughs) and um kind of skipping ahead this is this is something important about Baal worship It, it in some way first of all it was atheistic because it denies the true god it denies a creator god it denies a single god it 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 emphasizes purely natural imminent forces uh, it's an eminence religion in that regard, if you want to call that religion, ultimate concern. It is, and yet it is magical because you use magic to control these things. Magic being any method you use to try and influence and manipulate these forces, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but third... I mean, that's, that, just a side note, that is one reason why the the claims that things like Harry Potter or even Lord of the Rings that some people uh, admittedly consistently also uh, deny. To say that those are witchcraft is absolutely nonsense. Yeah, they don't, they don't understand what witchcraft is. 
Mm-hmm. Side note, this was actually, I was going someplace, but now that she pulled me aside. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, when You're Harry welcome, po- listeners. Yes. <laughs> when Harry Potter first came out, I didn't know a whole lot about it. And I, people actually asked me, and I was thinking, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but um, once I had read it, my wife and I, as, as literature teachers, thought this would probably be a good idea since people would be asking our opinion. We actually enjoyed a lot of it. I thought she's a particularly good mystery writer. If she'd stop inventing adverbs randomly, um, <laughs> she, 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 and she would have been a great mystery writer. I, I, I read the magic. I read the fake Latin and said, this is, <laughs> this is fake Latin. This is not, this has, bears no resemblance to much of anything. But my concern was, was, was it's amazing that people get all upset. They're going to learn to practice witchcraft and they're going to learn to chase demons. Not that way. However, Harry Potter is a punk. <laughs> and I had three very young girls at the time who, who were quite capable of reading. And I thought, I do not want them hanging around with this punk. He is a liar. He defies authority left and right. He's got no respect for authority. And he's not, he's not the guy I want them to hang around with. Now, when they get older, they can read this on their own. That's fine. And we did that. And eventually they did read it and they, they liked it. And that was that. And they went on. And there's no great influence on them. They appreciated it for what it was. We watched the movies and and that was that. And it's gone. And it's not, we're not, you know, hanging up voodoo dolls or anything. <laughs> but I think I think it was ironic that so many people saw the fake magic as this great demonic threat and not realizing that who you hang out with mm. is much a much greater threat to yes. Hang out with people who practice fake magic is one thing. To hang out with people who lie to their the authority figures, their parents and teachers, that's a real danger. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought, anyway, back to, and that kind of brings me to this, which was where, where my original point. So the Canaanite religion was atheistic. It was magical. It was secular in that it denied any transcendent meaning to life. And yet, it was thoroughly demonic because demons took advantage of the situation and they did step in and they did make use of it. Uh, when we read later in the Psalms, particularly in, in, in um, I believe it's Deuteronomy, they were told, the children of Israel were told they sacrificed to demons, to devils, and not to God, to new gods lately came up. They gave their children to the devils, uh, to the goat, the, the goat demons and such. Yes, on the one hand, this religion was utter nonsense. Sacrificing your child does not bring rain. And yet, the demons saw an opening and they used it. And they used this religion and the the limited ability that God, the the limited amount to which God let them do magic in history, to seduce and terrify Mm -hmm. and torment a whole planet for for a thousand years. Uh, until Christ came, until the gospel came and shattered all that, to read the pagan the pagan writings and take them seriously, uh, to read, for instance, Socrates claims that yeah, the, mm-hmm. the the God who speaks in my head, and all of the philosophy majors blow it off of oh, it's a figure of speech. He's talking about the voice of God. He says he's in talk. He's talking to a demon. Now, demon didn't mean to him what it means to us, but when the New Testament writers and when Jesus wanted to say demon as in devil, they picked up the same Greek word and used it without hesitation. Mm-hmm. As far as they were concerned, these things that the, the, the Greeks called d- demoniai, demons, were fallen angels. They were dark angels. They were, they were ministers of Satan. And so that, that was a reality. And until Christ came, the world was basically occupied by terrorists. Uh, and, and Christ banished all that. Uh, here we can think of um, St. Athanasius is on the incarnation of the word where one of his proofs that Jesus is really God is, yeah, what shut down all your magic? What shut down all your oracles? Why can't you find any oracles anymore? Why is Delphi silent? It's because Christ came. Because mm-hmm. the gospels come amongst you. Jesus won. They're, mm-hmm. they're gone. They're, they're, they're not doing much of anything anymore. And, you know, we, we, we get all excited. We hear mission field stories of some little demonic manifestation. We, Ooh, that's cool. Ooh, that's scary. The whole world used to be like that. Yeah. yeah. And it's not. And it's not for a really good reason. It's because Jesus won. Jesus died and he's alive. And, and these things are shut up, which can, and, and that can take us to uh, 
the primary Baal story in the Old Testament, which is Elijah mm. on Mount Carmel. Before uh, we get there, yeah. can we talk about Gideon? Because that's a little bit closer. Oh, sure. Chronologically. So Gideon, after he obeyed the Lord and won the battle that he was initially called to fight, mm-hmm. he did he set up a calf? Am I remembering that correctly? No, he set no, up, he set up an, an ephod. Ephod, Which has got to be right. one of the weirdest things. It's super For, weird. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You made a gold image of a robe or of a chest plate. Yeah. Neat. That, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> what? His early, I mean, his name, the nickname his dad gave him was Jerubbabel, mm-hmm. which is let Baal plead. Or here's the guy who says, let Baal defend himself if he's so great, which is, you know, summing up what, what the name is supposed to be. One one writer has called him Bale Fighter. Well, that's not what it says, but that's the you know kind of the that's idea. That's the gist. Yeah. Yeah. Here is Gideon was an enemy, an opponent who brought down Baal. One of his first tasks was to bring down an Asherah pole and destroy an, an image of Baal in his father's backyard, and he did. But unfortunately, at the end of things, he does default a bit to the Canaanite religion, in that he uh, after his last battle says, "Okay, can I have an uh, earring of gold from all your captives?" And they do, and he makes. This image of an ephod. Now, the only ephod of any significance was the high priests, which contained the Urim and the Thummim, which were used to get yes and no answers from God. Basically, he asked, can I make a gold Ouija board, please, so that I can be in contact with God better? What are you thinking? And and we don't really know. There's no explanation. But we do Uh, know that the people gave him the gold. Yeah. And And then he said, here, we're going to worship Baal Barith, right? Well, that's the next generation. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. I missed that. Yeah. His, uh, he, there, there are hints of him wanting to establish a dynasty. I mean, they mm-hmm. ask him, will you be our king? Oh, no, no. I will not be your king. My son will not be your king. God will be your king. Says all the right things. <laughs> then and, he names his son. <laughs> yeah. Then he names his son Abimelech, which means my father is king. And he goes and gets a bunch of concubines and has 70 kids. You know, this is not good. And one of them, the, the uh, Abimelech, does hang out with some of the local Canaanites who have taken the worship of Yahweh and merged it with Baal worship. And so they call, and they call their new version of God, Baal Barith, God of the, or Baal of the Covenant. Which sounds really great if you translate it into English, right? Lord of the Covenant. Like that sounds like God, but Yahweh or Jehovah, that we have that as Lord in our Bibles, but yeah. that was God's name. That wasn't just some stand-in word. Right. So we'll, we'll be getting to, to getting before too long. But yeah, this this is something that runs all the way through. The kings of Israel, the northern kingdom, deal with it. Kings of Judah deal with it. Even even some at some very, what we would think would be high points in their history, it suddenly shows up again. They had a horrible time getting away from this. And, and as I was saying, the... Um, the big influx of Baal worship comes when Ahab, the king of the north, mm-hmm. marries uh, Jezebel, who is the daughter of a man who was not only king of Tyre, I think it was Tyre, I can never remember if it's Tyre, Sidon, one of the two Phoenician cities. He was also the high priest. We actually know him from secular history. And he's connected to historically to Dido, the, um, mm-hmm. the queen of Carthage that Aeneas runs into in his voyages. So wow. we, we do have some historical context there. This is a, a real guy, and Jezebel's a real, a real woman, who comes in through a political deal, comes into Israel as queen, and um, wants to fortify her position and her husband's, and understands that Baal worship is a really good way to do that, because Baal worship puts authority in the hands of royalty. Because it's the king's job, right, to make sure the land is prosperous and healthy, and successful and prosperous. And therefore, the king has to be an expert or be surrounded by experts, eggheads, uh, <laughs> uh, on experts on magic, on how to, to placate the bales and, and, and their female I mean, how, counterparts. How useful could they be? They didn't even know like what to do when the king liked Daniel more than they than Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they, they didn't, you know, they weren't that good. But that was the theory. And so Ahab buys into it, and they get rid of all the prophets of God that they can. He sets out on a one-woman uh, martyrdom team, 
Uh, and, and then Elijah, by prayer, calls for a famine. And after three and a half years, Ahab is ready to listen and to uh, go along with this contest. Elijah says, okay, we're all going to get together on Mount Carmel, which is Phoenician territory, Canaanite territory. It's a mountain, so it's up near high near the clouds and the thunderstorms. And you have all kinds of prophets of Baal. I'm the only one left on the other side. So you have home court advantage. And we're going to put some sacrifices there, but not light them. And we're going to call the names of our gods. And whoever, whichever God answers by fire, we will let him be God. And the people think the people think this is a great idea. And Ahab goes along because Ahab was very pliable. Mm-hmm. And we see a, a little touch of, of what Baal worship was like. It's not worship as we think of it, as giving thanks, expressing love, adoration to a person whom we whom we esteem as the greatest being possible. It's okay, Baal. We need something from you. Get with the guy. We we need the stuff. We our reputations are on the line. Our jobs are on the line. Our lives are probably on the line. We need some rain. So give us rain. And so for from about nine in the morning, time of the morning sacrifice, still noon, they jump around and shout and call out, Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. Spirit, hear us. Baal, oh, hear us. Baal, 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 hear us. <laughs> it's like that goes, groundhog. Have you seen that groundhog that somebody like gave a voice to from a nature documentary? It's like, Alan, oh, yeah. Alan, Alan, <laughs> oh, <yes>. Alan. <laughs> it's like that. It's like this. And, and they do it. They do it for a very long time. And then Elijah starts mocking them. He's a god. Surely he can do He can pull this off. Um, maybe he's maybe he's sleeping and he needs to be awoken. <laughs> maybe he's turned aside, which means maybe he's using the facility. He's using the bathroom. Uh, maybe he's gone out hunting. You know, go, yell louder. <laughs> it's also kind of humorous to, to imagine two potential uh, realities behind the scene, which is either Bail going like, all right, cool. We're going to light. Th- oh, yeah. oh, some, oh, it's not working. Uh, I gotta, I gotta, I got, I can, I can do this. I can do this. I, I, I I'm bail. I'm bail. I'm, I'm good. I'm cool. I'm something's not working here today. <laughs> and the other one is just like God going, um, uh, what's a really small angel. Yeah. Can you go put him in a headlock for about four hours? <laughs> Which is about what happens. Yeah. Um, uh, the story goes on that then the, the prophets, having failed and being mocked, start jumping and leaping at the altar. And then they pull out their little their little lancets and start cutting themselves and, and sprinkling their blood all over the place, figuring that sadomasochism, pain, shows of blood, cutting oneself will get the attention of the gods. And it gets people's attention, you know. Because and it's so thoroughly unnatural, is that the it's idea? It's thoroughly, un- yeah, it's unnatural. The way to shake up nature is that is to do that which is unnatural. Yeah. So uh, along with uh, prostitution, ritual prostitution was a basic sacrament of, of Ashtaroth worship, but they were not beyond uh, homosexual prostitution and bestiality and, of course, child sacrifice. Things that were anti-natural to shock nature into getting going. And the, the Bible's comment is, there was none to hear, none to answer. And I appreciate what you did, Brian, because often um, people's response is, well, of course not, because Baal's not real. No, that's not the point. Hmm. There were demons there who wanted to intervene, who wanted to not lose this one. And God, as you say, basically sent little angels that put them in a headlock, shut them up. No one's talking here. No one's saying a thing. Let them be with them look like idiots until this is over. And then Elisha can deal with them. So that's, I mean, that in a nutshell is, is, is Baal worship. It is naturalistic. It is secular. It's atheistic. And yet it's magical. So we can insert here all that Lewis wrote, both in screw tape letters and in that hideous strength about the, um, Oh, what did he call it? The um, the secular magician. That's not his phrase. Materialist magi- magician. The the when, when Dr. Human, Frost. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, but as a generic category in screw tape, he says, "What happens when when humans no longer believe in God, but do believe in demons? Well, they won't call them demons. They'll call them <laughs> forces or power or natural energies 
but they will in effect be using or seeking after demonic things in parapsychology mm. as a science <laughs> while denying the existence of God and spirits. He says, screw tape says, when that comes, the, the end of the game's almost there. When we can shut the idea of God out of their minds and yet let them embrace demons, game's almost over. Well, it's not, but, and, and we can see that because that's more or less what this was. They're, they're, cons they're, they're dealing in natural forces. If you ask these guys, do you know you're dealing with, with dark forces from hell? They probably would say no. And the <laughs> They'd more write Arya you Dye off as a crazy person. Yeah, the more erudite would talk about etheric tensions and uh, natural forces and gravitons and you know, whatever. But in fact, there were demons behind uh, all of this. And God kept them on a short leash. Once Christ came, he kept them on a much shorter leash. You don't <laughs> see this to any great extent anymore. Can we, before we get too far, can you finish the story of Elijah? Because well, we which, didn't which, finish. <laughs> I didn't. Well, I was talking about Baal worship. I know, but then you started the story and you didn't finish it. <laughs> well, what happens is uh, the time of the evening sacrifice, uh, Elijah blows the whistle and these bloodied, battered, absolutely failed people have to leave the uh, playing field. And he goes and finds the remnants of an old altar to Jehovah that has been torn down. He rebuilds it. And whereas they were doing all of this technique and all of the shouting and yelling and bloodletting, and they were doing stuff, Elijah just comes and talks to God in what amounts to some very short sentences and basically says, let everyone, let all the people know. Here, he repeats himself only, only once. Hear, O Lord, hear, and send rain so that all these people know that you're God, that I'm a prophet, and I've done all these things at your words. Beginning the covenant formula. God is authority. He is the representative. The, the word of God as something they're supposed to obey. And then he pleads for it. the sanction, the blessing, in this case, of rain. That, that as his prayer had started this, now his prayer might end it. Uh, in the meantime, he's had them douse his sacrifice with all kinds of water, dug a trench around the altar to absorb it. So he's really making it hard. And yet in response to that very simple personal prayer, God blasts the thing to pieces with fire from heaven, uh, consumes the, the animal, the slain animal, the stones, the water in the trench, all of that. And all the people begin yelling, the Lord, he is the God, the Lord, he is the God. Now, Elijah's mistake uh, was to think, oh, they're all converted. No, they were all impressed. They all liked mm -hmm. good special effects. They would all be great candidates to go see Star Wars or a Marvel movie. But they were enough on his side. Their, 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 their team was disappointing. So, yeah, I've never been in one of those, I don't know, this is not something that happens very often, but I, I'm sure it must. When you go to see a ball game, basketball, something, soccer, and your team is so absolutely lame and boring and doing nothing, you start <laughs> rooting for the other team because they're cool. <laughs> And showing sportsmanship and helping your guys get up off the field and actually standing and putting in their weaker players so you guys maybe have a chance of scoring something and not look at you say, no, oh, well, that was a cool team. I wish our guys were like that. You know, the, the, so the people of Israel were enthusiastic for the moment and disappointed with their prophets. And so when Elijah says, round them all up, I'm going to kill them, they say, okay. And he, in, in terms of biblical law, executes them as God's own messenger. And then comes the matter of rain. Well, it rain. It, we we got a thunder strike here, but it's it's we need rain. And he goes up on the mountain and he begins to pray. And after each little round of prayer, he sends his servant go 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 look toward the ocean, toward the Mediterranean. And each time, nothing, 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 nothing. nothing. Seventh time, there's this little cloud like a man's hand. Right, just says that's it. Go to the king, tell him he better get down fast before the rains make the roads impassable. Mm -hmm. And as, every, as they're collecting everything and everyone's fleeing the mountaintop, the thunderstorms come, the clouds dump their rain, and Elijah, in the power of the Spirit, runs before the chariots. And he's stoked. God's finally on the move. Well, we're going to have to wait a long time to hear the rest of the story and what <laughs> comes in the next chapter, because Elijah has lessons to learn, which amount to Trying to force the hand of the nature is not the same thing as knowing what God actually is planning on doing. 
Uh, yes, God lifted the curse. Yes, God sent rain because Elijah, his friend, asked him to. But it was not time for full-scale revival. And God had other plans, and God was in complete control, and God was very present, even in the rains, and as he was in the drought. And God's hand was in all of these things. God rules nature. He rules it personally. Uh, it's not something where it's running on its end. And, th and this, I suppose, is probably maybe, well, I think there are two points here. One has to do with how we understand science. One has to do with how we understand civil government. So help me remember those if I, if I get lost. Uh, with regard to science, we have come in the West to look upon nature as a construct of physical forces interacting with one another on the subatomic level, whether we're talking electromagnetism or gravity or strong and weak forces or whatever. And these things are set in such a pattern Apparently, since the Big Bang, or if you're a Christian, you can say God, God established this system, which now runs more or less on autopilot. This, this whole thing of secondary causes that keeps going and keeps interacting, sort of like God wrote a computer program, entered it in the system and punched return or enter. And now it's just running. This is called natural law. Now, if you're a Christian, you say, and God can interrupt the program hit the interrupt button, and do something different that's called a miracle, and then he can restart it again. But by and large, he created the natural laws that run the universe. We've talked about this before. We've talked about this. This is deism, and, it is, it, it, and Calvinism can fall into it if we do not balance our doctrine of predestination with a robust doctrine of providence. And we have talked about this. Jezebel's idea that it's the job of the state to ensure the health and safety and well-being of society through the technology at hand. In her case, magical technology, but technology nonetheless. Now, in most of the ancient worlds, most of the lands of the ancient world, the kings and queens were gods and goddesses. They weren't so much in, in Canaan. They weren't divine persons, but they were divine agents. As long as they were in office, they were supposed to represent the, pow represent the powers of Baal and Ashtaroth. And they were supposed to do the magical rites that kept the world running up to and including those, those um, rituals that spoke of the resurrection of the land each season. And so, yes, the pagan world did have its cycle of death and resurrection. To what degree the, the modern notion of the dying and rising God was contemporary is something people debate. But let's give it to them for a moment. We, Ezekiel speaks of women weeping for Tammuz, the, the lover of Ishtar, who died and rose again, and whose resurrection is celebrated in springtime. Okay, wonderful, great. Um, the God, but the king and queen must must keep that up and must must do the rites and or make sure that the rites are done and must must enable their people to do these rites. And so the king has his own spokesman. In Israel, they were called prophets because Israel had a history of prophets. Elsewhere, they were called priests because their job was to serve Baal. Does this sound at all familiar when the state takes to itself the job of using technology to maintain the health, welfare, and blessing of its people, even if it has to do horrific things to make that happen? And I think this is a good place to insert everything that Lewis says, and the Russian, he says for that matter, on sociology. Now, I believe there is such a, I believe there's a place for Christian sociology. They basically didn't. Hmm. If you remember that hideous strength, there's this one scene where Hingis confronts uh, Mark Steddock, and uh, Mark is kind of back on his heels and says, well, I, I understand if you, you have qualms about, uh, about what I do, but, if, but if the science is like sociology. And Hingis says, there are no sciences like sociology. <laughs> and if I found that chemistry existed to take away from every Englishman his his child and his land and his occupation and hand it to a bunch of professors and prigs, I'd give up chemistry and go raise flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, he calls out, Mark, you think that you, you, you can study man. I believe you can only get to know him, which is different. Uh, Lewis was very harsh on sociology because he saw it. And he, and he later was challenged by this. He said, I'm not saying that sociology is a ticket to hell. I'm saying that any kind of invitation to hell in the 20th century will most certainly come dressed up as social planning by sociologists. Mm -hmm. 
See Give also the... every communist regime in the 20th century. Yeah. Ooh, and if we want to be have a really spicy take in there, insert all the nation building that the United States has been taking mm-hmm. part in for the past 70 years. Yeah. Yeah, about that. Yeah, as if the state by its technocracy and its military force can recreate nature and man and society in such a place that in such a way that everybody can be well. And when we see this in our own country right now, you can argue from scripture that the state does have some responsibility. And you really have to look between the lines, but I've written articles on this and it's possible. You know, if you if you have a mad well, mad dog in our culture, if you had a goring ox in their culture <laughs> and and people weren't taking care of it properly, then the state could step in. Once it had done something that amounted to manslaughter, the state could step in and say, kill the thing. Or you should have you should have been keeping it bound all this time. There's that. There's and then there's the people could be uh quarantined for leprosy under certain circumstances. That's about it. There's nothing about, okay, and King, go out and make sure everybody is healthy, wealthy, and wise. Provide for them education. Provide for them medical care. Freedom uh, from fear. Freedom from fear. Yes. All of these are rights, obviously. You have a right to not be afraid. You have a right to total health care, to total education. You have this, None of this is what God ordained civil government for. And yet, like the pagan world, we expect everything from our gods and their servants, as long as they let us free to pursue our personal private vices, mostly in private. But if a few of us want to go out there and come out in the open and do them, well, you know, let's not be judgy. But as for me, just make sure my business won't fail. I'll have plenty of sales next year. Uh, No bad diseases will get to me. And then leave me alone in my sexual life and my drug habits, and I'll vote for you over and over and over again, because that's freedom, and that should be frightening to us. And on a related note to that too is um, you use the word technocracy, where you have that with larger tech companies as well, essentially trying to steer the direction that culture goes in a not so light-handed way. Yeah, and... there, the terms of service are almost more relevant to life than actual laws these days yeah exactly uh i mean there's a there's a twitter account that i i love it's called crime a day and every day (laughs) they share a a a law that is that is a federal it would be a felony for you to commit and it's it's the most ridiculous things you could ever imagine they're considered felonies like you know soy milk has to have on its labeling a statement that it contains less than 5% of additives in order to be legally considered soy milk. And if you break that, it's a felony. Okay. <laughs> Just really yeah. weird things. I, th- I think, I, but yeah, anyway, um, that was a side note. Basically, you get, you, you, you have exactly that. You have social planning via uh, state sanctioned monopolies. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Not that the state is directly running them necessarily, but that all of the... <laughs> I think it's more likely to be the other way around, given yes, the that's nature true. of bureaucracy. Yeah, but the... basically, they've set up laws that allow the existing players to maintain their hold yeah. and gain more of the market share, essentially. And, and so the state has directed it towards monopoly, and they're the ones running the show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That would be an interesting conversation by itself. And what we'll I'm sure we'll get to it. Uh, over again. So we don't end on another sour note yet again. <laughs> Thank but, you. But Rescue us. <laughs> Jesus reigns. There. Jesus We've ended on a very positive and very true note. As opposed to the out of time and space resurrections of these mythical gods, Jesus came back to life in the real world, in time, in history, mm-hmm. having satisfied the penal demands of the law, and thus, yes, reigns. All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. He's at the right hand of the Father, and where, as we are inclined to trust humans, mere humans, lowly, scummy humans, to save us, Jesus bids us trust him to save us Mm -hmm. in in all that this world is supposed to be. But that's going to mean that the state has to stay and do its job 
and not try to take over everything. The book of Revelation shows us what happens when that goes on. We get this beast-like thing that wants to devour everything, starting with Christians. But when we yield to the Lamb, then governments shrink. The state doesn't have to do everything, but it does have to enforce the law. And some of the very things you're complaining about suddenly became a concern. Oh, you're trying to bribe us. I think that is a felony. You're trying to manipulate government. Yeah, I think maybe felonies in there someplace. Oh, you you came up with drugs that actually kill people. Yeah, that's probably murder. Let's let's take that to trial and see. Um, the state can go back to protecting us from bad guys rather than trying to run our lives for us. But the scary thing for most people is that surrenders us to freedom. Now we have to feed ourselves, make our own medical decisions, pay for our own health insurance, or however we're going to go about it. We're not happy. You know, it becomes a question of what do you want? What are your choices? How do you want to serve God? And the big and the enormous sphere of freedom that Jesus gives us, what's he calling you to do? Once we have the boundaries of his law, what's his calling in your life? And, and what happens if you screw up? You, you start again. Because he's a God of second chances. He's a God of resurrection. He's a God of new life. Mm. He's and a God of a lot more chances than two. A lot more than two. <laughs> yeah. All right. Shall we wrap up with some recommendations for this evening? Um, I'll recommend, I don't think I've recommended yet the show Yes Minister and the sequel show Yes Prime Minister. Oh my goodness. I think it's one of the best sitcoms ever written. James Carey, British sitcom writer and author of the book, The Sacred Art of Joking, considers <laughs> it the greatest sitcom ever. I'll recommend his book some other time. It's a, it's a fun one. Um, but Yes Minister stars Paul Eddington and Nigel Hawthorne as the Minister for Administrative Affairs in England in the 1980s, I want to say early 80s, late 70s. And uh, Nigel Hawthorne plays Sir Humphrey Appleby, his um, permanent secretary, sort of his assistant, the liaison between the minister who represents the government and the civil service who are all theoretically supposed to be following orders from the government. <laughs> And it is the most beautiful demonstration of the operation of bureaucracy that has yep. ever been brought to light. And it's hilarious. It I like it because it kind of plays like a radio show almost. It's like a lot of dialogue, a lot of wordplay. And there's this character named Bernard, who is the minister's, uh, like we would call him a secretary, like he manages his schedule and stuff. So he's a little bit less involved in the civil service than Sir Humphrey, but he's still a a civil servant that's his employer but you can kind of tell over the course of the show of oh sir humphrey went to oxford and is very proud of it and uh, he looks down on the minister because the minister only went to the london school of economics and doesn't know any greek <laughs> and then you get bernard who's like just fascinated by classics and it just bursts out at the oddest times and it's delightful <laughs> so yes minister yes prime minister there's a particularly satisfying episode of Yes Prime Minister called The Key, which I would recommend especially. Okay, okay. great. Brian, you got anything? Yes, I am going to recommend. First, the, the little bit of backstory why I'm recommending this is uh, my fiance had a friend come and visit us. And basically, we made a reference to the item that I am going to recommend. And she. She's from Africa originally, and she does not know everything that is, you know, popular American culture from the past 30 years. So I went into my room where I have this, and I, I said, you should just open up to the first and just start reading this. And the thing that I recommended to her and now to all of you is Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> oh, yes! Yes, of course. Uh, we got to explain where... Calvin and Hobbes got their respective names from as well. <laughs> and um, yes, it was, it was very fun to introduce someone to that. <laughs> so nice. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> well, this is, this is bizarre. It's kind of a tribute to some of Brian's remarks, last minute thing. Uh, there is a book by, I believe he was a libertarian uh, in the 20th century. It's called The Triumph of Conservatism. May not have been a libertarian. He may actually have been kind of a leftist. I don't remember. 
Uh, but that doesn't matter. He he un, by conservatism he meant not what we think of. He meant the Eastern establishment. Hmm. And the book it's called the, re, the subtitle is a reinterpretation of, uh, interpretation of American history. His argument is not is rather than as we usually think it the robber barons, uh, the Carnegies and Rockefellers and, and and Fords and such. It's not that they use capitalism to crawl to the top and kick everyone off and, oh, aren't we glad the civil government finally reined them in? His argument is, no, what they did when they realized that they were in danger of the free market, of competition, they went to the government, they went to people within the government and said, we will, we will fund your next uh, campaign if you will pass through these bills to regulate us. Mm. <laughs> and I appreciated the way Brian described it, which means we just all got grandfathered in. But anybody new is going to have to jump through all of these hurdles before yeah. they can even begin to challenge us. Mm -hmm. And so the government creates the monopoly that it claims to be busted against. Yeah. Yes. So uh, Triumph of Conservatism, a reinterpretation of American history by Gabriel Kolko, K-O-L-K-O. -K -O. It's been a long time since I've read him. I, I think he's re certainly readable for a history major or a poli sci major. I don't know if everybody would enjoy him. But if you want to understand the shift out of the 19th century into the 20th century and how Wall Street got to be Wall Street and how the, our, our government became under the thumb of bankers and industrialists, this is, this is worth your time. So mm. there you go. Sounds a lot like Bert Folsom's work. I do not know this. Oh, um, he wrote The Myth of the Robber Barons and Uncle oh, Sam oh, Can't Count. Oh, Right. Okay. I do know this one. Okay. <laughs> I, I have the book. I just didn't recognize the author's name. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very much. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. This has been a wonderful conversation um, about death and magic and all sorts of things, <laughs> but also the resurrection of Christ. So, yes. Uh, thank you also to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning, tuning in. Uh, if you'd like to join our financial supporters, you can visit our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Thank you very much to our financial supporters. We really appreciate you. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Rumble. Still on Goodreads. Still on Goodreads. Have a wonderful day. See you next time. Thank you.